Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Karen Hubert, and I'm the director of the MA in Writing program. I'd like to welcome all of you to this thesis reading this evening. And I'd like to begin our reading by thanking all the parents, partners, siblings, friends, coworkers, babysitters of our students who are here tonight because they recognize the value of this writing work. I'd like to thank on behalf of the students, each of these friends or family members who maybe helped with tuition, unloaded the dishwasher or put the kids to bed when it was technically not their turn. Um, and who read a chapter of the novel or the essay or the article for the gazillionth time and gave feedback um, for supporting these students in ways large and small. I'd also like to thank our faculty, so many of whom have joined us today, for sharing their considerable expertise with students and giving so generously of their time. I know that this is time that always comes at the expense of their own writing because they care deeply about their students. Um, this is a gift graciously given, but I know it's not without sacrifice. So thank you to all of the faculty members that are here tonight. And I'd also like to thank our alumni for joining us. Um, our alumni are part of our vibrant literary community in cities all across the country. And I'd urge our students to connect with them as they are the ones out there hosting reading series, networking events, monthly write-ins, as well as editing literary journals, volunteering as writers in the schools, and participating in writing groups that endure long after their time in our program ends. So thank you to our alum for giving back to the community and keeping the literary flame alive. Um, this fall, we have 21 students graduating with half reading their thesis tonight via Zoom and half reading tomorrow night live on the Johns Hopkins University campus in Baltimore. But all of our readers have this in common. Each one of our readers tonight has completed a 50 to 70 page thesis of high quality writing. This writing, a story, a personal essay, an article, a novel, began as a tiny idea that flitted through their brains at some inopportune moment while walking the dog, say, or standing in the grocery store aisle weighing whether to buy Johnson's baby oil or Burt's bees, or while staring out the bedroom window, wondering how long before this crummy driver struggling to parallel park bumps the car behind him and sets the alarm ringing, which wakes the dog who barks, who wakes the baby, who cries. What these students did and what sets them apart from ordinary mortals is hold on to that kernel of an idea. Despite these distractions, these text alerts, these emails, these dog barks and baby cries, and the cacophony of interruptions that comprise daily life. They held the little idea cupped in their hands. They studied it, considered its merits. They saw its potential and they blew life into it. They grew a story. Over the last few years, these students have done the hard work of tending their crop. They have untangled syntax that threatened to choke off meaning. They have trimmed unruly tangents and words. They have trained an image in this or that direction with similes and sounds and symbols and perhaps a little alliteration. They have deadheaded passages and ruthlessly pruned entire sections to promote the growth of the whole. They have labored mightily when metaphors like this plant one have lost their graceful sway and become knotted and cumbersome. They've wisely scrapped them in the compost heap as I'll do now. What I would like to say is that these students have worked very hard on the stories they're telling here tonight because they have something to say. It sounds obvious, but I'm not sure it is. This is fresh in my mind because last week in my memoir and personal essay class, 
students were having a conversation about whether one needed to publish in order to be considered a writer. It was one of those, if a tree falls in the forest and no one hears it, did the tree fall conversations. Whoops, I'm back to plant metaphors. Um, but to reshape the question. If a writer sits on her lunch break in her work cubicle, scribbling away in her daily journal with no intention of shaping a narrative or sharing her thoughts, is she a writer or a dilettante? To my mind, publishing or consistently working toward publication as a goal is the heart and soul, the very purpose of writing. It's our call to the world. Yo, listen up. I have something to say here. We aren't writing diaries, and this is not a therapeutic exercise. These are stories, ideas, observations about the human condition that we write to share, to publish. All of the students reading tonight have submitted their work for publication as a condition of their graduation. Um, some have already published, and I have no doubt that many of them will submit publish in the days ahead. I have this faith because they are writers, not dilettantes, and the difference between those two things is commitment. The committed and persistent writer is the one standing in the back of a crowded room with her hand raised, excuse me, excuse me, I have something to say. She's like Hermione in the classroom bursting with the answer, or at least some provocative questions. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, I have something to say. And that is true of each of the writers here tonight as they read a five minute excerpt from their master's thesis. Consider this their first instance of sharing and keep your eye out for that second instance, imminent for so many of them, of publication. Now, I'll turn our podium over to faculty member Susan Mahadi Daraj, who is our Master of Ceremonies this evening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Karen, and welcome to um, everyone, to our graduates, to family and friends. We are thrilled to have you here. The great American writer Toni Morrison once said, I would like my work to do two things, be as demanding and sophisticated as I want it to be, and at the same time, be accessible in an emotional sort of way to lots of people, just like jazz. That's a hard task, but that's what I want to do. Tonight, we celebrate the creative work of our graduates who have completed a hard task because that is what they wanted to do. You will hear excerpts from their work that embody Morrison's words. Their writing is demanding, it's sophisticated, but it is also always, always accessible in an emotional way. I've been honored to work with our graduates these past few months as they completed their final semester and their final course. For two years, they have been hard at work producing original material, studying practical and theoretical books on the art of writing, reading the great writers closely to study craft, and workshopping the manuscripts of their classmates, thus learning the skills of an editor. They've been finding and fine tuning their individual creative voices, and we are thrilled to share their words with you this evening. Tonight, you'll hear a wide range of work in a variety of genres. You'll hear an excerpt from a fantasy novel in which a fierce queen prepares to confront a demon, flash fiction about an, anxi an anxiety inducing visit to the dentist, a realistic novel about an artist who seeks peace and inspiration in a small coastal town. You'll listen to thought-provoking creative essays on topics from the formation of sunspots to the world of Def Jam and much more. All of the writing tonight demonstrates the rich diversity of our students and their talents. And let me say this to the graduates themselves. For your professors, many of whom are here tonight, this is an especially rewarding evening. We are seeing the culmination of your work and we will, we will recognize many of the pieces you're reading because we saw them first in a workshop and we watched as you carefully and painstakingly revised, edited and expanded the writing. Nobody knows better than we do that this work is hard work. As Toni Morrison said, it's a hard task. The challenge is to sit with a world you have conjured up on a page, 
to render it realistic to a skeptical reader, and finally, to make it emotionally accessible to your audience. We congratulate you on this tremendous accomplishment, and we are excited to see where you go next. So let's begin our evening. Each graduate will read for a few minutes from their thesis. And tonight we are going to begin with the work of Christopher Pearson. Welcome, Christopher. Thank you, Susan. I'll be reading an excerpt from chapter one of a travel memoir called Hounded about my bus trips around the US and Mexico in the summers of 2003 and 2004. The room felt normal. If one were to follow the Greyhound script, things would remain very ordinary. Get your ticket, wait for your bus, get on, get off. But inside any Greyhound station at best is a calmness yet to be shattered. I'm going to New York City, a man announced to the room. His long black dread swayed as he staggered from the ticket counter. Anyone want to smoke a joint? I kept quiet. I wanted to keep a low profile because I had a spliff and nub of hash in my this guy did not have a low profile. Someone from the waiting room took him up on his offer and together they went inside. When they returned, the guy with the dreads repeated his destination, New York City, and added, Hunt Jews. He sat across from me. I figured we'd see a lot of each other over the next few days, so I mentioned I was headed to Buffalo. He showed me his itinerary. We would travel on the same route until Cleveland Thursday morning. It was Monday afternoon. His name is moved between Tacoma and Seattle, but came to the Tacoma station because he liked it better. That made no sense. The first stop on our trip was a two hour transfer in Seattle. He claimed to have made 100 grand in six months doing a concert promotion. His cousin was Spike Lee, but Spike never shared any of that money with him. Zenith wasn't hurting though. I got money. He showed off a lot of cash, maybe a few hundred dollars. Look at all that money. I'll take care of you. People have taken care of me, and I'll take care of you. You need something, food, whatever, you just let me know. We're cousins. He certainly seemed completely out of his mind. Plus, he had money to spend as his insanity saw fit. And bud, he might make the perfect traveling companion. We need us some chicks to get to Chicago. I got mad skills. I bet I can get us both a girl by Chicago. You don't believe me? That's okay, I said. Zena shuffled down the bench of seats to sit next to a girl. She looked to be in high school. I was nervous. Hey, girl, we started. We're going to Chicago and meet us some chicks. And this is opening line. I'm going to Ellensburg with my dad, she said. Zenas walked over and sat down next to another young girl reading from a textbook. Hey, he said, you Ethiopia? No, the girl said, but my parents are. You look so beautiful. I love you. Where you live? Zenas, I said, rejecting my role as his wingman. She's not going to Chicago. <clears throat> Cousins, right? A new thought crossed his mind. Yeah, I said, we're cousins. You watch my back? What? I asked. Zemus moved next to the vending machine. He tucked himself out of view of the ticket agent and security guard. He cracked open a can of beer and sucked. Ah, you let off. You want a corn dog? Got it at the gas station. For all that hundred thousand dollars that he made, none of it went to his luggage. He carried only a black garbage bag, and yet he pulled out a corn dog. No thanks. He ate it. Seattle, well, the station attendant. I up my backpack. This is it. Come on. I walked to the door. He stayed put. This is our bus. I'm not going to Seattle. He said, I'm going to Chicago. Think juice. We transfer in Seattle. I said, then we go to Chicago. Then you go to New York City. He wasn't listening. I was starting to feel responsible for this guy. His inebriation made him helpless in the face of mundane tasks like getting on a bus. He needed a sitter, and I had the schedule to see him across the northern U.S. I couldn't, however, risk my trip for his. I gave up trying to convince him and got in line. An attendant came over to handle the Zuma situation. The attention he drew was a relief to me. No agent checked passengers' luggage, so I didn't have to worry about the cash in my backpacks. I boarded the bus. It was almost empty. I took a seat near the back. From the window, I could see the attendant dragging Zuma onto the bus. Any other mode of public transportation, and he would have been booted off. The Greyhound leaves no one behind. Zemus walked down the aisle, garbage bag slung over his shoulder. What's up, Perez? He said, taking the seat in front of me. He handed me a portable radio. Can you find me a radio station? I don't think they allow them, I said. I want music if I smoke, he said. The man seated behind me perked up. You got Bud? He asked Zemus. Anything else? Yeah, I got ganja. What do you want? I can get anything. Spoken like a true dealer. 
I can get you anything. And we're on a bus to New York. Got any black? The guy asked. Nah, man, he said. Tar? I asked. This guy must be pretty desperate to be so bold, asking for heroin on basically his third word to us. Heroin's a different class of drug, even to drug users. I'd seen ecstasy dealers get offended when asked if they had any, as if they would ever peddle something so reckless. I haven't had a shot for a day and a half, the guy said. Speed, coke? Zima stopped listening. Here we go, Zima said as he slid into the seat next to me. He pulled out a 40-ounce bottle of malt liquor from his garbage bag. This was more his speed. They'll kick you off with that shit, the guy behind me warned. I got kicked off in Portland for drinking. Zemus couldn't be bothered with advice. He crouched forward in the seat. He took a swig, careful to keep out of the bus driver's view. Then he chugged. He paused. I backed against the window. He puked. Puked again. Chunks of corn dog rose out of the orange puddle. Just about everything I had seen come from that garbage bag was now sloshing around under our seat, and I'd only been on the road for 20 minutes. Zemus is a gift of a character. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, if you doubt uh, the dedication of our students, Chris actually lives across the globe and it is very, very early in the morning where he is joining us. So thank you, Chris, for your um, reading um, and for your dedication. Next up, we have Matthew Ribble. Welcome, Matthew. Good evening. Uh, this is from a feature article that appeared in Wired last summer. Uh, it's called Cloudy with a Chance of Plasma. I'm going to read you an abridged version of the introduction. To a photon, the sun is like a crowded nightclub. It's 27 million degrees inside, and it's packed with excited bodies. Helium atoms fusing, nuclei colliding, positrons sneaking off with neutrinos. When the photon is ready to head for the exit, the journey will take about 100,000 years. There's just no quick way to jostle past 10 septillion dancers, even if you do move at the speed of light. Once at the surface, the photon might set off solo into the night, or if it emerges at the wrong place at the wrong time, it might get stuck inside a coronal mass ejection, a mob of charged particles with the power to upend civilizations. The cause of all the ruckus is the sun's magnetic field. Creating by, created by churning particles in the core, the field starts as a series of orderly north to south lines. But the star's molten, so different latitudes rotate at different rates. 36 days at the poles, 25 at the equator. So very quickly, those lines stretch and they tangle, forming magnetic knots that puncture the surface and trap matter beneath them. Typically, the matter cools, condenses into plasma clouds, and falls back to the surface in a fiery coronal rain. Sometimes, though, the knots untangle spontaneously, violently. The sunspot turns into the muzzle of a gun. Photons flare in every direction, and a slug of magnetized plasma fires outward like a bullet. The sun has played this game of Russian roulette with the solar system for billions of years, sometimes shooting off several ejections a day. Most come nowhere near Earth, and it would take centuries of observation before anyone even noticed. And at 11.18 a.m. on September 1st, 1859, Richard Carrington, a 33-year-old pub owner and rookie astronomer, was in his private observatory sketching sunspots. Suddenly, the spots on his projector erupted into a blinding beam of light. Carrington sprinted off in search of a witness, but when he returned, just a minute later, the image had already gone back to normal. Carrington spent that afternoon trying to make sense of what he saw. Had his lens caught a stray reflection, maybe an undiscovered planet passed between his telescope and the star. While he stewed, though, a plasma bomb silently barreled towards Earth at 3 million miles per hour. When a coronal mass ejection comes your way, here's what matters most, the bullet's magnetic orientation. If it has the same polarity as Earth's protective magnetic field, you got lucky. The two will repel like a pair of bar magnets. But if the polarities oppose, they'll smash together. And that's exactly what happened on September 2nd, the day after Carrington saw the flash. That evening, electrical current flooded the sky over the Western Hemisphere. A typical bolt of lightning registers 30,000 amperes. This geomagnetic storm registered in the millions. As the clock struck midnight in New York City, the sky turned scarlet. 
fearful crowds poured into the streets. In the Rocky Mountains, a bright white night sky woke a group of laborers. They assumed it was morning and started cooking breakfast. Nationwide, vast sections of the telegraph system overheated, melted, stopped working. The Carrington event, as it's known today, is considered a once in a century geomagnetic storm. But it took just six decades for a comparable blast to reach Earth. And in May 1921, train control stations and telephone arrays caught fire and burned to the ground. In 1989, a moderate storm, just one-tenth the strength of the 1921 event, left the entire province of Quebec in the dark for nine hours. In every case, the damage was directly proportional to humanity's reliance on advanced technology. More grounded electronics, more risk. When another, one, when another big one heads our way, and it could any time, existing technology will offer one or two days notice. But we won't understand the threat level until the blast reaches a satellite one million miles from Earth. If the orientation is dangerous, this $340 million piece of equipment will buy humanity at most one hour of warning before impact. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Next up, we have Stephanie Slattery. Welcome, Stephanie. Thank you. I am going to be reading a uh, flash, flash fiction piece and it's titled The Dentist. Sitting in the waiting room, I try to calm myself. There's wetness forming on the underside of my hands. My heartbeat thumping in my ears. The rhythm is deafening, but it's a welcome distraction for the time being. I try to focus on the painting hung across the wall from where I'm sitting. It's a famous scene of watercolored flowers, maybe a Monet, no doubt a reprint. The blues, reds, and yellows mesh well together, giving the painting a cheerful look. I'm not feeling the effects of this painting as my breathing quickens and my stomach flip flops. I glance nervously at my watch, 9.45. My appointment is for 9.45. The hygienist will be calling my name in just a few short minutes. The beating in my ears is thunderous. Stella, the hygienist calls. Her words intertwine with the chaos between my ears. I hear her call my name, but I cannot muster the nerve to stand up. I know I must, it's my slot, and this root canal is not going to go away. But my fear of the dentist is bigger than my rationalizations. It's a lifelong fear, one that has strapped me so tightly to this ordinary waiting room chair. Stella, are you Stella? The hygienist asks once more, looking right at me. I can't talk, my mouth just won't work. I stare at her, unable to make a noise, unable to move a muscle. Like a deer in headlights, I am frozen frozen to this drab mustard colored, very standard, every doctor and dentist office has one chair. My heart is thumping so loud, I am sure it is audible throughout the entire office. My hands are behind sweating. They are now dripping with perspiration as they cling tightly to the faux wooden armrest of the chair. I try my legs again, willing them to stand up as the humiliation of being such a wreck washes over me. Stand up, I scream internally, hoping any muscle will hear the command and jump to action. The only movement I can muster is the shaking from fear. Suddenly, the room starts spinning. The walls become distorted. The tables and magazine racks twist into odd shapes. My chest tightens. My lungs are deflated balloons and I am helpless to inflate them. Eerie noises filter through the thumping of my heart and mingle in my ears. A low, distorted sound, as if someone is playing the record at too low a speed. I close my eyes in hopes to stop the spinning. The darkness behind my lids has worsened the waves and my eyes spring open once more. Straight ahead, the hygienist is smiling at me. The look on her face is warm and friendly. Still, I am a prisoner to this chair, a hostage caught in a standoff. Once more, I urge my legs to hold me up. They're waiting for me. You must move and lift me out of this chair right now, I internally demand. Nothing, not an ounce of movement nor feeling is experienced. It's as if my legs do not exist, but they do. I can see them. My favorite Kelly Green Chuck T's at the bottom of them. Why won't you work, I plead. My hands slip repeatedly off the armrest, leaving fog on the glossy finish. I try again to fill my chest with the now humid office air. Sweat is cascading down the divot of my back, soaking the waistband of my lucky brand jeans. Plucky my ass. They have fused themselves to the vinyl mustard seat cushion holding me against my will in this staunch short back chair. 
The perverted sounds of my rapidly banging heartbeat and the voices in the office are a tornado between my ears. My breathing is shallow and quick. The distorted, washed out yellow walls Stephanie, I think you might have hit your mute button. Silence. The spinning comes to an abrupt halt and the walls quickly ease away from me. Warmth comes back to my lips and the wetness of my palms suddenly evaporates. Blood rushes through my chest, down my legs and fills my green chucks. I realize how silly I'm being, getting all worked up and all. It's just the dentist, I chuckle to myself. It's just the dentist. I stand and face the hygienist. One quick glance at my watch. 9.45, right on time. I take a deep soul cleansing breath and compose myself. After all, I am an adult. It's just the dentist. It's just the dentist. The mantra plays over in my head. I walk through the office door, a few steps down the hall into the room on the right. My eyes see the lounging dentist chair waiting with open arms, arms waiting to swallow me. My heartbeat quickens. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank you. Next up, we have Torrance Boone. Welcome, Torrance. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm reading from chapter one of my in-process novel titled The Bait Shack. This opening introduces the protagonist, Nora, an artist arriving in Provincetown, Massachusetts for an art fellowship. Nora hustled for a starboard seat as the ferry rounded the tip of Provincetown. Bullying voices from Richard, the foundation board, her agent, savage bill collectors hissed in her head. She had cast them collectively as her monkeys. The monkeys were always with her, picking at the scabs of her past, taunting her like a teenage nemesis. Her stomach still churned from the rough ride. She tried to focus on the view, a squat lighthouse at the sandbar's edge the crescent bay shimmering sunset purples and reds, eroded piers punctuating the shoreline in poetic ruin. It had been a long day. The Accela train to Boston had broken down, almost causing her to miss the last scheduled boat. She would practically inhaled a bad hot dog and watery gin and tonic during the wait, not expecting a squall that made the trip like a roller coaster ride through Cape Cod Bay. She fought her gut with deep breaths of air, begging it not to embarrass her in front of the other passengers. The monkeys convinced her that a small subset were her soon to be students, certain to recognize her later as that woman who'd hurled over the bow. She clenched her jaw and lowered her head between her legs. Beads of sweat popped along her hairline. As the ferry approached the dock, she scoured for more evidence that she had made the right call coming to this storied place, a creative refuge she hoped would free her from the mind muck, free her from whatever it was preventing her from finishing her commission mural for the Marvel Foundation. Her agent Ashton had negotiated a final extension to Labor Day, but threatened to drop her if she didn't deliver. College, grad school, and credit card debt had obliterated the advance. Survival mode in Manhattan crushed all inspiration, every idea she had for the project gurgled up solace. They had threatened to sue her for the advance if she didn't create a work of substance, whatever the fuck that meant. And then there was Richard, who berated her as childish while dangling promises of financial and professional support to manipulate her. Asshole. With the boat nearing the berth, she took in large black and white photos of aged women mounted on the side of a wharf building. They leered at the harbor in expressions of resolve, grief, expectation, their wrinkles like grooves in the sand of low tide. She followed their eyes as the ferry passed. They seemed to reproach her, her locks there like she was an intruder, firing up the, map, the monkeys again. Richard's gonna cut you off. He's right. You're an undeserving child. Locals milled about on the dock awaiting loved ones. The boat rattled as gay men tossed suitcases around like toys. She waited on the sidelines, depleted, not up for the competitive commotion. With the last tourist filing out over the metal plank, she called a taxi and made her way to the oversized roller bags pushed to the edge of the storage rack. She tugged at the luggage, 
overstuffed with touchstones that anchored her sanity. Dyson hairdryer, miniature wooden Buddha, lavender scented candle, sketch pads, favorite brushes, rabbit vibrator, Gumbrick's The Story of Art, her treasured Georgia O'Keeffe stenciled scarf. She settled under the covered waiting area and pulled out a bottle of water. Wet armpits darkened her olive green t-shirt. Nausea ruled out a check for body odor. She hoped her unit had a tub. All she wanted was a bath. The house was as she recalled from the pictures in her fellowship packet, but now with a lush rose garden in full June bloom. The cabbie loved the bags up the staircase with bougainvillea coated banisters. A migraine loomed as the monkeys prepared for her evening torment. Too exhausted to explore the apartment for a tub, she entered the master bedroom, closed the blinds, threw off her clothes, and slid into bed. Thank you. Thank you, Torrance. That was great. Next up, we have Alicia Moore. Welcome, Alicia. Thank you. I will be reading an excerpt from my novel called The Dead Throne. It is a scene in which Diatha has tried and failed to summon a demon. Even amidst her injuries, Diatha found herself bewildered. Everything that could have gone wrong did. She'd taken too much blood from her own body, preoccupied with her distress as she was. She'd slurred the incantation, likely getting the words wrong. There was no telling what she'd summoned or how she'd send it back. The circle glowed dimly in her line of sight, her sleepy gaze locking on a tiny form. Was that it? Was that the demon she'd summoned? Diatha laughed at no one. At least it wouldn't be able to cause too much trouble. She wasn't sure how she'd made this mistake. She hadn't mucked up a spell this badly since she was a child. She sighed, closing her eyes and musing on this most recent of her string of failures. She'd been keeping an eye on the lines in the bowl, measuring the blood as it dripped. As she dozed off, she wondered how a mere ounce of blood became a filled vessel over the course of but a few seconds. Had she cut herself that deeply? She thought she'd have been more careful than that. She didn't know, and she was too tired to muse any further. Diatha drifted along in the dark. She wanted nothing more than to rest, to recover so she could try again. She could only imagine what her lords would say if she came out to admit that she'd fumbled the ritual. They thought ill enough of her as it was, but the door was locked. She would rest. She would try again. All would be well. No one would know. Yet a sound pierced the darkness. What was it? Something small but loud. The keening was enough to pierce her ears into her very heart, and Diatha could bear it no longer. Was that the demon? Her eyes opened, and Diatha was back in the catacombs, but she was not alone. No, the entity she'd summoned remained in the center of the circle, still small, still screaming. Puzzled, Diatha sat up. Though her arm was flaked in silver blood, her wound had healed. The pins and needles had vanished, the sick feeling in her stomach gone. Instead of that dull, distant feeling, her mind had sharpened back into focus. She approached the circle and couldn't decide if she felt flabbergasted or frightened. The circle's lines were empty. Her blood had vanished. In the middle of the circle sat not a powerful demon awaiting a bargain. Instead, it was a baby, a newborn, crying and shaking. For a moment, Diatha wondered if this might be some manner of trick. But what would a demon stand to gain from masquerading as an infant? She didn't know. She probed at the air with her mana, looking for a greater being hiding in the room with her. There was nothing. She felt only the flicker of life within the tiny baby screaming to be held. Diatha sighed. She walked into the circle and lifted the child into her arms, swathing it into her robes. A minor inspection revealed that the baby was a little girl. She made toward the door but stopped. She looked down at the baby. Her pallor was a soft lavender, the same shade as the wild flowers that bloomed in the spring. Her ears were pointed. Two nubby horns sprouted from her skull, soft white fuzz covering her scalp. Diatha could feel a thin tail wrap around her wrist, and the baby scrambled to get a hold of anything, finally settling for Diatha's hand. The baby whimpered as she sucked on the queen's finger, hungry but finding nothing. She could already hear the comments, the speculations, that Diatha had traded her body for power, that this was the consequence of some fell bargain between her and something nasty. Poor Tiernan, having married an evil sorceress who would betray him in the demon's bed. 
that the baby had been created from nothing but Diatha's very blood. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you. Next up, we have Sean Shank. Welcome, Sean. Thank you very much. Uh, the piece I'm reading is a short creative nonfiction uh, memoir from the time when I was invited to do shows with Def Jam, and it is titled Def Jam and the Sean Shank Redemption. It was the most important set of my comedy career, and I don't remember any of it because I blacked out after the first joke. I've always been a fish far out of water. In fact, that water has reliably been 582 miles away while I'm on the other side of a mountain range across a desert around a field of stick em up cacti and on top of a deserted mesa in the southwestern United States where I flop around gasping for social acumen. I've been told I'm a great communicator until you meet me in person. Then I become that guy where your friends say, eh, you just gotta get to know him. This pivotal moment started with an invitation. A comedian friend, Jacoby Ray, called me one Saturday night and asked me to be part of a comedy contest in Indianapolis. The invite would take me down the rabbit hole to the inner city where I would be a foreigner in a foreign land. So you've got to jump back a decade and some change for the emotion of the next scene to capture the full gravity of what follows. A portion of the reason I am was, is, are awkward is I grew up tragically poor in the middle of four cornfields in Deer Creek, Indiana. Our neighbors lived in homes where duct tape stood watch in place of roof shingles and tables sat drooping in front of houses covered with rusting gadgets and water-filled dishes acting as year-round yard sales. My parents were vaguely hermits, artists. My dad was in a band called Axis that played with sticks at Fitch's Glen in the 70s. Very cool. And they had only a handful of friends. And you can't blame them for their antisocial behavior. Scientists say that any human can only handle five truly close relationships at any time. I know they like my sister, my grandma, Terry, Joe, and Nancy. That left me at a slight out as a slight outcast, even at home. This meant that my childhood was a proving ground for social stupidity that clings on to this day. I was never prepared to face people in the real world. We also didn't travel much. Travel kills prejudice and broadens the mind. That was not my childhood family. We also didn't have cable that could have expanded my horizons. Other people had cable. I recall kids talking about cable with strange sounding channels like Nickelodeon and HBO. On Monday, boys would huddle in the corners of the classroom and talk about the scrambled channels they'd sneak out of the rooms to watch on Saturday night, asking each other in hushed voices, did you see anything? Yes, we were separated from the world. We weren't complete shut-ins or Amish. We were just country trailer poor. There is a difference. We did have TV. I have vague memories of being 40 feet in the air at 10 years old, clinging to the side of an antenna tower that my dad had reclaimed from a junkyard and cemented into the ground on the west side of our house. I remember looking down at the bubblegum finish of the cement base that was nearly hidden under the tangle of horsetail and clayborne lawn grass, thinking, I'm going to die up here and for only five channels. Five channels where I don't see anything. All of this made me a child hermit. That and spending more time running through the woods and pushing my nose into books kept me neatly away from the outside world. I did have an early education. I knew the world was a hard place because of all the bullying I suffered. Being born into poverty and legally blind educates you. Still, I grew up loving people, just not understanding them, and that only expanded when I went out into the world of big cities where the real people lived. Jacoby called the next day with the address of the club, Hey Chaz, in Indianapolis. I wasn't familiar with Indy. I was familiar with cornfields and country roads, not 465 and the suggested 55 mile per hour speed limit that is followed about as rigorously as the repayment plans of overdue library books. I had no concept of anything to do with inner cities. The closest exposure I had was Pryor's Place, Fat Albert, and Sesame Street since they were all on PBS. I showed up at Chaz at 7.30 p.m. The show was at 8. Standard rule in comedy is to show up early. Half an hour is my limit. Keeps the club from panicking and gives you enough time to settle in and get the lay of the land. I opened the door to the club and stepped inside. It might as well have been a stargate. I stepped out of the cornfields and into a world I wasn't a part of and didn't understand. Normally, I'd take time to get centered, but the owner slash booker ran up to me in a panic. Oh, my God, Sean, you're up. I was like, I'm up. I'm not supposed to be up until 8. You're up now. She pushed me toward the stage, pushed hard. I stumbled across the scuffed and warping hardwood of the stage. I stopped and righted myself just behind the mic and looked at a sea of faces that was new to me. I had never seen even more than a handful of African-Americans in person. Josh, Jessica, and Jamie were the only three people of color that went to my school when I grew up, and they were adopted by our science teacher. Every other face of color was observed on the other side of the curved glass of my parents' Zenith television. At that moment, I realized that maybe my socially isolating parents did me a slight disservice 
by buffering us so far from the light of mixed humanity. Then, from the front row, a voice yelled, What the fuck? He white! My brain blanked. I only remember my first joke, and it wasn't even my joke. It was a street joke, and even though I had an hour and a half of material tucked up in my head, this bit was the only combination of words that my mind could cobble together. What does Snoop Dogg put in his washing machine? Bliach? There was a pause, long and pregnant. Then laughter. It was rich, loud, and powerful. It swept back to the wall, including Korsmere in the rear of the club, and then forward again. After that joke, nothing. I don't remember the crowd talk, the jokes I told, where I went on stage. It's all just vague, swirled gray smoke when I try to dredge up the memories. I know at the end of it, I received a standing ovation. I sat down at the only open stool available at the bar afterwards and ordered a whiskey sour and drank it with trembling hand. The owner slash booker ran up to me, clapped me on the back and yelled, damn, white boy, you got some flavor. I legitimately responded, what, like vanilla? She laughed as hard as anybody that night. I wasn't trying to be funny. I had no idea what the hell she was talking about. Hey, she said, part of the winner's package is to do some shows with the Def Jam tour. I already called my guy, Tony Metro, about you. The next show is in Detroit. I just nodded and replied with, well, that sounds swell, because that's what you say when you're from Deer Creek, Indiana. Swell. I didn't know what a Def Jam was. I knew what a Detroit was. There were car makers and tires there, and I was getting offered a pig gig, so I accepted. She clapped me on the back again and ran off. A few moments later, Jacoby walked up and smiled at me. Killer set, bro. You mad? No, not really. He said, sorry I didn't tell you that it was an all-black club. And I said, no, I don't care about that. I just don't think you told him that I am an all-white comic. He took a drink of his beer and set it on the bar next to a ring of condensation that glowed dull in the neon light. He paused for a moment, the look on his face like a father who's been preparing to have a talk with his kid. He looked at me, then into me, where my soul and my preconceived notions sit together as boon companions. Right, he said, and if I had told you the situation beforehand, would you have come? Shit. In a swirl of cigarette smoke and beer back breath, Jake had called me to the carpet like the tattooed guru he was. I didn't have time to reflect on his wisdom. I was headed to Detroit. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Next up, we have Abigail Allen. Welcome, Abigail. Hello, everyone. Um, I am going to be reading an excerpt of my novel, Bluebird Blackfish. It's a magical realism novel that interweaves the two stories of my characters, Ambrose and Cornelia. I will be reading the first chapter of Cornelius. In the before I awaken blue, I am swimming among organs, faceless roses lunging through hoops of red, through rungs of silver white darkness, my mother's womb. Warm my hands, winged and feathered between the fingers, pressed to the walls of a dimpled shell. No longer a constellation, I am girl. Gentle is the voice that surrounds me. This is what I lay in, the voice of love complete. You have come to a new country, I hear the voice say. This voice drenches me, praying as I am made. Pearls of blood, rosaries of poetry, prayers of love collecting. Before I was dust, I was a collision of dust, loose, unmortared mud. The voice of love murmured, my child, and I was no longer. Meat lashed to bone, a cherry pit heart twisted into place. Soul like a thimble woven nimbly throughout. I am girl, daughter of love. A wall of red light is shimmering below me. Beneath layers of body, I am metamorphizing. I rest myself through webs of human chrysalis. The nebulous world around me shivers. The spider cracks of blood and bone and meat shiver. The handprints of all the children that came before me, the children that did not live beyond the yoke, wave me on. I am afraid, I say. Do not be afraid, love says now. What will happen, I ask. You will forget, love echoes. Forget, I carry a world around me. I am shoulder to shoulder with moon and stars. How can I forget this? Will I forget you? But then love says, it is time. And a yawn opens before me, a doorway, another voice calling out of the soft darkness. That's it, baby, keep on, keep on. And the voice of love commands, break down the door. I am sucked through a crack in the wall, the pressure against my skull, a hooting drum. A watery voice says, she is here, she is almost here. Hands, wrinkled hands, pull me free. I emerge in a big world. She is blue, she is blue. A face, eyes, nose, mouth, cheek bends down, midwife. The thread of umbilical cord is shiny green. 
This baby ain't breathing, she says. Midwife speaks over me. I'm sorry, Magnolia. Ma now sunk back in her pillow, melting in pink, starfished over the bed, legs and arms spread, hair uncoiled like Medusa. Motherful, motherless eyes looking at me. The calico bed sheets rippled and stained like strawberry skin. Send her back in, Ma says. Maybe she ain't done cooking yet. Midwife looks down into my face and I see that she is old, old. She has seen many faces like me. She has buried many of me. I want to tell her what I've seen too. I wasn't nothing before now. I was swimming in a galaxy of women, a swan siren, mer baby, blue baby of extraordinary color. It was endless color. Listen, I say, but I have no voice to say. I can't go back. Don't send me back. My voice is trapped. Stunted shrieks rattle inside me. Air, breath, coy like a faint memory. Brushes my lips and slips away. That first feeling, fear. Midwife slides her hand over my sleepy skin, her fingers pumping into my chest, pressing firm and hard, trying to make my little lungs pop. She's pressing dark violet thumbprints into my skin. The pressing's hard in my ribs. I wheeze and flap, my limbs undone from the rest of me. I'm all rhymes. I'm a fidgeting pigeon, an absurd bird. Looks like she's trying to fly away. Midwife's face is wet, and to me, her face is the whole world, and the whole world is weeping. How do you think it feels when the whole world is weeping for you? Ma screams from the bed. God! Fists of red clutching sheets of holy white. Paw prints, ma prints of blood. Her brow is salivating in sweat, hunger black in her eyes. Why do you always take them from me? Midwife's stare is transfixed, but I look past her. Past the apple slice ear, through the hoops of hair that hang like planet rings undone. A donkey-like man hovering in the corner, chin up, calm. Give my daughter to me, he says. She dead, Ma scoffs. But big arms scoop me up, warm like the voice of love. Wide and warm. This is my world now. This is my paw. Thank you. Thank you, Abigail. That was lovely. Next up, we have Tori Wells. Welcome, Tori. Thank you, Susan. Good evening, everyone. I will be reading the beginning of a personal essay in which I explore the importance of narrative through one of my family's traditions. It's New Year's Eve, 1957. I imagine my grandma, Monica, my dad's mother, is sitting in a chair in the living room of the family's home outside of Albany in Gilderland, New York. She's reading her own writing from a piece of loose leaf ripped from the binding of a journal. My grandpa, Roger, and five of their seven children are sitting around her. The last two, including my dad, still haven't been born. Her short red hair frames her cheeks, reading glasses perch atop her nose, and a smile pulls out the corner of her mouth as she looks out at the faces of her children, the next generation. What I look forward to most in 1958, she reads, having a baby toward the end of June. I look at her tight flowing script from the night she wrote those words and realize the June baby she looked forward to was my dad, who wouldn't be born until the middle of July in 1958. My breath catches in my chest with the knowledge that my grandma, who I never met, was dreaming about my dad's arrival on that New Year's Eve night, the same year she started an annual family tradition that would become my dad's family's living narrative. Fast forward nearly four decades. There's a fire in the fireplace because it's cold in Lake George, New York on the last day of the year. I'm probably eight or nine years old and I'm sitting on an area rug in my aunt's living room. My mom's nearby in a rocking chair by the wide door frame that leads into the dining room. The warmth and scent of the burning wood wrap around us. My grandpa is in a stuffed armchair by the front door where he always sits. He's wearing a flannel shirt, his white hair neatly parted and swept to the side. From where he's sitting, he can see most of his children and grandchildren, my aunts, uncles, and cousins, two generations gathered around him. I think back on this memory and can't clearly see faces, but I can make out bodies on the couch, in chairs, and on the floor in both rooms as they listen to my mom read. For years, this tradition was held in my grandparents' home. Sheets of paper with questions written, then later typed, were handed out to each member of the family to answer. The questions were always some variation of what I remember most about the past year, what I'm looking forward to about the year ahead, what is my New Year's resolution. After scattering to different parts of the room to individually reflect on and answer each question, 
The New Year's sheets were collected and read aloud by my grandma in the family's living room. After my grandma died, one of my aunts continued the tradition at her house and my mom volunteered to read the sheets out loud. In my memory, her voice is comforting and familiar, as familiar as the scent of my grandfather, Old Spice cologne mixed with wintergreen lifesavers, as familiar as the tight bouncy curls on my little sister's head, as familiar as the questions we still answer today. This tradition, my dad said, was born out of my grandma's desire to draw her children together on New Year's Eve, especially as they grew. My dad's earliest memories of these New Year's sheets dates back to the early 1960s when he was about five years old. At that young age, his recollections centered around a Christmas gift he just received, starting school or family trips to Lake George. His resolution was often decided based on family committee and frequently had to do with having fewer tantrums. But as he grew, so did his memories and his hopes. One constant was my grandma's request that everyone be together listening to one another's stories. Stories are a central part of my dad's early memories, even beyond his family's tradition on New Year's Eve. Books were the scaffolding to my grandma's life. She inhaled them like air, often staying up late into the night reading. She passed that love of story and knowledge on to her children, sitting beside them as they explored the world's book encyclopedia set that she and my grandfather financed so they could provide their children with information from around the globe. She passed her love of story on outside her home too, first to her students as an elementary school teacher, then as a volunteer at local libraries, and later as a bookstore owner, where she collected and sold antique and out of print books. When my dad's family moved out of one of their homes in Albany, they realized a wooden slat on my grandma's side of the bed was broken, but there were so many books stacked up around and underneath it, my dad told me, that they never knew it let go. Stories literally held my grandma up. When she died, my dad remembers thinking about all the knowledge, all the narratives that were gone with her. I've been thinking about the purpose of narrative lately, its role in helping us learn and helping us connect and helping us find meaning within our complicated lives. As a writer, I want to understand narrative so I can write deeper stories. And as a human, so I can better understand myself and other people. Even as I write this essay, I can see in my mind what I want to say, but in writing the narrative on the page, only then can I begin to understand what it means. We tell ourselves stories in order to live, the late Joan Didion wrote, and humans have across lifetimes and generations, stories told through pictures, through spoken word, and on the page. Some of my first recollections are family stories, stories I've heard so many times my mind believes the memories belong to me. Now I watch as my young daughter Grace inhale stories like air, like they are fundamental to her being, like they are folded into her DNA. I hear Grace reciting stories as she sits in bed at night, lantern in hand, flipping through the pages of book after book. Other times she makes the stories up herself, dreaming, she calls it, this use of her narrative imagination. Sometimes I catch her sifting through photo albums, running her hands over the glossy images, When she looks up and sees me enter the room, she starts peppering me with questions. Who is this? What are they doing? Was I born yet? I see how eager she is to understand how she fits into our family's story as her own story, her life's narrative begins. Thank you. Thank you, Tori. That was lovely. And now I'd like to welcome Joanne Skerritt. Welcome, Joanne. Hi, everyone. I'm going to be uh, reading a chapter um, from my uh, still in progress novel, Our Flair. In this chapter, um, we will see the main character uh, who has been called uh, to the hospital to say goodbye to her dying mother. The thin yellow curtains, stained brown carpet, gray and white paint and dust caked window panes are beside the point for now. You see only what you want to see in this moldy third floor apartment you call home. The gray haired men howling on the sidewalks and the elderly prostitutes swaying, tweaking in the mornings. The cars with blacked out windows racing down South Capitol toward I-295. Paper registrations flapping, death in their wake, you can conveniently ignore. You will make this a nice place once the money starts coming in for real. 
For DC, it's a good deal at 550 a month and DD has her own room. Your mother called these kinds of neighborhoods worse than Rwanda, but it's your place to be yourself and not somebody else's American dream. You ease your way out, careful not to slam the heavy door, leaving Dee Dee alone with the lights on and the TV blasting the Lion King, which always puts her to sleep. You pray she won't wake up. You hope to be back in a couple of hours to finish practicing your dance routines for the club. You sigh. You had to get better. The other girls were killing you on tips. The lift is a minute early. It's the last of the five free rides Asia gave you last weekend. Eventually you plan to get a car and your own house with a yard for DD to play in. You plan to become a midwife, a nurse, a midwife nurse. No more charity from Asia or anybody else. Martin Luther King had his shock lit bright for the police as usual. You heard shots earlier, but even the cops seemed bored and unperturbed. It's only 9 p.m. Neither the bright lights nor the cops will stop the neighborhood night business. And you think, how do these kids grow up like this? Funny thing is you can't allow yourself to think how you ended up here. You recall middle school teachers in Silver Spring telling you, how enriching it is to grow up so close to the nation's capital without having to actually live in Washington. Well, okay, you think, watching the little kids playing among the masked and hooded dudes on the corner. In some ways, though, it's safer in Southeast than it was in Silver Spring. You won't run into him here. You won't run into your old friends from St. Ignatius Girls, especially now they're all the way at their fancy colleges. You won't run into your own self here. You step out of the lift and close your mind to the images of Dee Dee waking up and screaming when she realizes you're gone. You hope the neighbors know how to mind their own business. The hospital called right when Dee Dee was about to fall out. She was in her bed looking up at the pink lights, the silver stars stuck on the walls and glitter bugs on the ceilings. You tried to create your childhood bedroom as best you could for Dee Dee. Wasn't quite the same, but it would do. If your mom ever felt sorry that she kicked you out and decided to come and visit your new place, she would see that you could make something good for yourself. She would see. Honey, your mom's not doing great. The nurse sounded like the social worker type, so damn concerned. We're going to have to place her on a ventilator. Do you understand what that means? The one time you tried to kill yourself, you heard a social worker type call her using that same tone of voice. Your phone lights up with text. How is Nanette Flair? You go see her in hospital now? It's the Rwandan guy, your mother's co-worker from the school cafeteria, who you think she's sleeping with and who is in a green card marriage with her best friend. People walk into the hospital, people walking into the hospital frown at you, at the bubblegum pink and platinum blonde microbraids spilling out from your white skull cap, at the heart-shaped tattoo on your temples. They think what they want to think. They won't know that you and your mother once lived like nice, regular people, that your confirmation at Our Lady of Lourdes is still fresh in your mind as you stare at the cross near the hospital entrance. Do you renounce Satan and all his works and empty promises? I do. The main door to the hospital opens and shuts, opens and shuts, as sirens and flashing lights illuminate the near distance. The smoke curls from between your thin fingers into the brittle cold air. There was no moon, no stars, just red and blue lights flashing, but you feel no sense of urgency. Maybe by the time you went in there, she would be wide awake and ready to go home. She would look you up and down, stick out her bottom lip, shake her head and bitch about the tattoos, the hair extensions. Once outside, she would spit on the sidewalk in disgust and say she wished she had raised you in Rwanda where people were poor, but had enough dignity to not go about looking like that. She would say something to cut you to the heart. You are not the kind of daughter anyone could be proud of. And you would know she was right. But even that would be better than standing out here in the cold night, wondering if the nurse was right, that your mother was fading, fading from this world. Thank you. That was so powerful. Thank you, Joanne. 
Our final reader for the evening is Haley Pavick. Welcome, Haley. Thank you. Uh, tonight, I'll be reading a selection from the first few pages of my short story, In the Clearing. In the Clearing follows Susanna, a middle-aged woman who took herself on a tropical vacation to escape her life and break out of her shell. We jump into her story as she and her hiking group follow their guide, Gabriel, on a journey through a, a tropical rainforest. However, the hike proves to be anything but peaceful as they discover they are not alone in the jungle. While the other members of the group chattered away, Susanna strolled behind Gabriel, focusing on the way his muscles bulged beneath the shirt, the way he tilted his head to listen to the rest of the hiking group, and how he seemed to know every hill and dip of the trail before he could see it. He was by no means handsome, his face scarred and slightly miscolored, almost struck by a greenish tinge. Perhaps at some point he had had skin cancer, or maybe he was using a special bug spray or sunscreen. The question of the cause sat in the back of Susanna's mind, but she couldn't bring herself to ask. Gabriel was not apt at small talk, or any kind of talking, really. She enjoyed this fact about him, felt connected to him through it. The conversations she had with him were awkward and difficult to get through, as if she were the first person that he had ever spoken to about more than the trail. Susanna tried to bring up his family, his parents, if he had any kids of his own. Gabriel grunted and simply told her, all over. When he did speak, it was to point out something interesting, like a rare animal grazing in a clearing, or to give an up everyone an update on the time. Camp had to be set up before dusk, when the limited light that peeked through the trees disappeared and it became impossible to see your own hand in front of your face. Despite his disinterest in talking, Susanna found Gabriel to be an excellent listener in all matters. She blathered on about every single thing that came to mind, random musings and memories, self-reflections, and even a few of her darkest secrets. Things she wouldn't tell her closest friend or her mother. Like the time her best friend Maggie stole her date at the homecoming dance and made her cry in front of the whole school. She earned the incredibly clever nickname of Susanna Snot, a name that followed her well past high school and that was probably still in use. From there, she moved on to the day she lost her father, suicide, and how her mother's biggest concern was that she looked presentable at the funeral. Her mother always worried about how Susanna looked. After all, she needed to find a husband before her eggs dried up and her mother lost out on the chance to have grandchildren. Despite what she told her mother, Susanna did want children of her own. She had, a pic had had a picture of her ideal life in her head since she was eight a wonderful, engaging job, a beautiful husband whom she wed at a small ceremony. They would have four children and a few cats, maybe a dog if Susanna was feeling adventurous, a small one though, of course. But those children she loved so deeply, she had already mourned them. She birthed them in her head, got them through school, watched them fall in love and buried them in the deepest recesses of her mind. They lived grand, perfect lives, no one to hurt them, no one to make them shatter. Only the purest love, untarnished by the pain, trauma, and loneliness of life. When Susanna reached her early 30s, she decided it was best that she never became a mother. Deep down, she knew she would be a horrible parent. A neurotic helicopter mom that would push her insecurities onto her daughters. An anxiety factory that poisons tiny minds until they fear even themselves. Thus, she got her tubes tied to ensure she could never disappoint her babies. Susanna's own mother didn't know, still sent her articles on geriatric pregnancies, reminders that it's not too late. While Susanna rambled, Gabriel mostly replied with a nod or shake of his head, the occasional hmm of agreement or a guttural grunt of disapproval. After a bit, Susanna felt she had said every word she was meant to say, that she could say, and the conversation sank into total silence. To her shock, Gabriel finally had a question of his own. He asked, this is really the life you want. Susanna considered the question deeply, tried to craft a response in her head, but her thoughts grew jumbled as lies tend to do when one is put on the spot. She imagined her mother, her friends, or miraculously her colleagues, and the beige walls of her bedroom, her entirely beige house. Years ago, she intended to paint the bedroom green, a deep green, not unlike the color of the canopy overhead. 
The can still sat in her closet, unopened, where she imagined they would remain until the house was sold. Susanna wasn't sure if paint expired, but she envisioned it covered in mold and fungi and somewhere along the way grew too terrified to pop off the lids. Death by paint, another ridiculous way to go. No, Susanna answered. No, it's not. Gabriel nodded. This time, the silence they slipped back into was more comfortable. And 30 minutes after Susanna last spoke, Gabriel stopped without warning, and Susanna, her eyes on the canopy, stumbled into him, the impact not unlike walking straight into a rock wall. She barely managed to stay upright, while Gabriel didn't seem to register it at all. He turned to the group, ignoring Susanna's quiet apology. She stood to the side, her cheeks hot, arms wrapped around herself, feeling eyes on her, but when she looked at the group, their attention was elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you all. That was really wonderful. Um, and thank you to everyone in our audience for coming tonight and supporting these writers. And as for our readers, thank you for sharing your writing with us. And maybe that may this be the first in a long line of readings uh, that you do. So thank you very much and good night.